Uh, so my talk today is going to be about maximizing the value of free software to your organization using CopyLeft. Um, and I am going to talk a little bit about um, the Commons Clause and server-side public license, not because I think they're actually like really relevant, but it's kind of a hot topic, and I think it kind of illustrates my point around this. Um, so the common Clause, the part of this that I think is relevant, right, the whole point of that was that they're trying to deny you the right to sell what they're presenting as free software. Um, because they want to sell the software. Um, so that's, and that's really the thing that they're looking at as, as a product or a service whose value derives from it. Like they want an exclusive right, they want to retain the exclusive right to provide sales to sell the product or services. Service side public license, they don't actually stop you from doing it, right? But anytime you're making the functionality of the program available, um, they want you to make the service source code available, which is fine. Like, I actually don't object to that at all. There's actually a lot of OSI approved uh, licenses that already do that. Um, but then they define service source code as really broad scope, right? It's your entire stack. So basically, it's impossible to comply with this license. And I mean, maybe if you're running like a free BSD stack and all of your tools are BSD licensed for backup and management, um, I'm not sure if you could run a cloud-hosted service provider entirely off of FreeBSD. Maybe there's a BSD person in the room who could tell me that. It would be weird if they were at CopyLeftConf, but uh, maybe they were trying to get some education. Um, but maybe you can do that. So um, what I want to talk about actually is not really so much the licenses as their motivations. Um, so this is a quote um, from Redis's labs on their FAQ. So why did Redis labs adopt the Commons Clause? Um, today's cloud service providers have repeatedly violated the ethos by taking advantage of successful open source projects and repackaging them in competitive proprietary service offerings. Right? So they're going from taking the software and turning it into a proprietary service offering. Right? They're not actually concerned about the software anymore, they're concerned about the services. Um, and why do they stop using the AGPL? This is what I thought was actually really kind of weird about this, because at the same time they're switching to a non-open source license, they're also saying our big motivation for doing this was that our clients asked for a permissive license. It's like, and I, I still have trouble with that. I'm like, wait, you stopped using open source software because your clients wanted an even more permissive license than the open source software license you were using. Because you want to control, you don't like the way other people are providing services. Um, and then the same thing with MongoDB. Um, what they're saying here, they used to use AGPL. Um, the reality is, is that once an open source project becomes interesting, it's too easy for large cloud vendors to capture all of the value. All of the value is what they're concerned about by contributing nothing back to the community. Well, I mean, honestly, you don't capture any value for free software by simply using it and not giving back, right? Like, there's, there is no value there from using it, really. Like, there's nothing to contribute back. Um, as an example, MongoDB became the most popular database in the industry. That's true, because it was open source. I think most people in this room would probably agree. And as a result, we saw lots of cloud vendors testing the boundaries of the AGPL license. That sounds good. Um, and at least they tried to make an effort towards server-side public license, even if I think it's probably um, disingenuous. Um, so what are these two companies trying to do? They're trying to prohibit and punish competitors for um, monetizing the value of the functionality of the software um, or substantially increasing the burden on compliance. Um, basically, they're also trying to stop people from also using server-side public license. Right? So what do I think they're doing wrong? Well, I think what they're doing wrong, um, and when I, when I talk to new clients, or I work in-house at a private company right now, Civic Actions, we do professional, free, uh, professional services around free software, so it's very often my CEO will introduce me to someone from either a competitive business or a partner, and they say, like, well, how does this open source stuff work? Um, I always try to make these points to them. It's like, they, what they're doing wrong is they think the commercial value is in the existing software, and I think that's just wrong. There's really no commercial value in existing free software. It's useful, sure, but there's not a lot of commercial value left. They think the cloud hosting providers are somehow capturing all of that value. I'm like, well, I don't think they're actually capturing that hosting value because I don't think there's anything there. Um, and the commercial value of free software is not in the functioning of the existing software, is basically my point. Free software is essentially a commodity. Right? It's really hard to make money selling apples because 
apples are apples. Unless you're like an apple snob, like I know there's a huge wide variety of apples, but go with me on that one. Um, but I think free software is a commodity. So what's a commodity? Um, I'm gonna do like that standard, like according to the dictionary thing, right? So we're at a free software conference, so I'm gonna start with a Wikipedia. Um, so in economics, a commodity is an economic good or service that has a full or substantial fungibility. Um, if anyone doesn't know what that means, it's basically something, it's a good that you can basically swap in and out with other goods and it makes no difference. Um, that is the market treats instances of the goods as equivalent or nearly so with no regard to who produced them. Right? It doesn't actually matter who produces a commodity. Right? If you buy an apple, you bought an apple. You don't care if it came from a grower in California who's got a really good reputation or if you bought it from a grower in Argentina who's got a really good reputation. You just buy apples. Now, maybe you're talking about organic apples. Maybe you're talking about a particular species of apples. You still don't actually care who grew the organic apple or the species of apple. Sure. You might. You might care about the system that's producing it, right? So you, you might have some, like, some ethics about how they treat their employees or maybe what goes into the growing of... I mean, you could care about the business model of it. Um, but, I mean, this is the definition of a commodity in, in, in markets, right? The actual good. Um, so, and if you look in Webster, because I'm doing that dictionary thing, um, this is the third definition. The first two don't apply to it. Um, a good or service whose wide availability typically leads to a smaller profit margin and diminishes the importance of factors such as brand name other than price. Um, and I think this is true of free software, right? Because you don't actually care where you get the MongoDB source code from. If you get it from MongoDB or you get it from GitHub or I give you a copy of it on a USB stick, you don't actually care, right? It's still the MongoDB source code. Like, it's a commodity at that point. And the real challenge with free software is, is that not only can you get a small price, you don't agree with me, that's fine, um, it's essentially zero because there's zero cost in doing those copies. Um, now the challenge with all of this for business models is, is there's actually a big fixed cost to producing new versions of software. Existing software is already, that price has already been paid. You don't need to pay for that already. Someone already did it. Now maybe they lost money on it, maybe they didn't, um, but it's already been paid. Um, I just have a question. What's marginal production cost? Marginal cost would be how much more money do I have to spend to make a second version of this, right? So the marginal cost of producing a car wouldn't be any of the research and development that goes into creating that car, but it would be the production cost of making a second one, right? So for software, the marginal cost is basically zero. Um, it's often literally zero, right, because if you're using GitHub, to me, the marginal cost is zero because Microsoft is going to pay the electric bill. So it's literally zero for me to make a second cost if I'm using GitHub, right? If I do it in my house, there's some fraction of a penny that I'm paying. Um, so what I think that they come up with is the wrong solution, kind of to the wrong problems. Um, one of the investors in Redis Labs um, said, that he had an article in TechCrunch entitled, Common Clause Stops Open Source Abuse. Um, which I think is weird that we're using proprietary software to stop open source abuse um, because what they're basically saying is they don't want people to use open source the way open source is intended to be used, which is to freely distribute it and let other people use it. Um, so, and I, I think it's weird because apparently their problem's non-existent because, yeah, there's a high fixed cost to producing that software, um, but in that same article he says, first, don't worry about Redis Labs. The company's doing very well and Redis is strong and needs more, more loved and more BSD than ever, right? So apparently they're making plenty of money off their current business model to pay for this software, right? So why are they turning their back on open source software if they're already making money off of the open source software? Like they have a business model that works. Um, well, I think some of the things are, are, the problem is that they're trying to capture the wrong dollars. They're upset that Amazon's making money off of this, right? But at the same time, and that would be great if they could get more money to reduce their costs, but they're also leaving money on the table too. Has anyone tried to contribute to MongoDB or Redis before? If you do, you're gonna to have to sign a CLA. And if you sign that CLA, you're gonna to have to give them an unlimited license to do whatever they want with it, including relicensing underneath the proprietary software. How many people like signing CLAs where you give the person controlling the project unlimited rights in your contribution? So, um, 
if you go to the MongoDB code base, and I did this for about an hour, GitHub is not very quick, I went through and I looked at the top 30 contributors to the MongoD code base. And I looked to see who their current employer was, if it was listed on GitHub, it was MongoDB or an affiliate organization. If it wasn't on GitHub, I looked them up on LinkedIn or on their personal blog and I found their employment history. The top 30 contributors to the MongoDB code base, and there are a lot of them, so I'm sure there are some people out there, but the re after 30 contributors, their contributions became very small. Every single one of them worked for MongoDB or an affiliate at the time they made the contribution. Is that maximizing the value of open source if you literally paid for everyone to write all of the software you have? No, you internalize the entire production cost for your product. Why would you do that? There's so much free software out there that you could be using and you're putting yourself in a situation you're gonna refuse other people helping you. Um, Value? Yeah. Um, so I mean value as in like whatever it is that you want out of it, right? So if you're Redis Labs, maybe the value you're getting out of it is money, like increased in profit margin. Um, value could be brand reputation for some people, right? Mm -hmm. um, GitHub is a proprietary software company. I think most people, most people would agree with that. It's probably not universally true, um, but inside of the industry, I think most people think of that. Um, I think of them use, but they do release free software, right? The Atom editor. Um, Jekyll, I think, is primarily funded by GitHub, or at least their main developer, I think, is one of the owners of it. Uh, they use open source software. The value they get out of it is advertising, right? Um, they want to be associated with the open source community. They do contribute to the open source community, just not from their products. They advertise and get their name out there by having us all write blogs in the software they don't really have any interest in selling, right? Um, so value could be different things to different people. Um, so they're complaining about the cloud contributors not contributing back to them, right? But at the same time, they're demanding that whoever contributes back give them an unlimited license. Right? There is an asymmetry in this relationship. I'm like, I'm mad you're getting paid for doing other work. No, being partners to share the cost and the benefits is not an option. That's not what I'm interested in. I want you to work for me for free, right? That's basically the demand from Redis Labs and Creative Commons. And a lot of these other companies who complain about the money that these cloud providers are getting is, well, of course you should contribute back, but I'm not gonna pay you to contribute back. You should just do that for free, and you have to give me unlimited rights because I don't want to be bound by these licenses myself. This isn't a partnership. This is a way for me to make money, and it's wrong for you to make money. So that's the problem that I think they actually have here. They're trying to solve for the wrong problem. They think that people should work for them for free because it's Open source, that's what it means, right? Open source software means that you work for other people for free. Is this Excuse me? Is this They're opposed to copyright concept, I'm not sure. Very close, close, oh. Like oh, close to the copyright concept. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, all these licenses are predicated on copyright, but it's more of a traditional way of how you would look at works there. I think it's a rejection of the open source or free software ethos. But I mean, based yeah. on like, wait, that's what I was going to say. Based on the top, it doesn't look like their roadmap is in, in any way like dependent on the contributions, right? Because they're all just paying their own employees to contribute to the thing. So the the whole idea that they're this whole charge that. AWS or whoever isn't contributing back is actually, because they don't actually depend on that. So that's actually a very disingenuous accusation that the cloud providers aren't contributing, right? Right, but based on what we've discovered. I mean, that's, that's what I would say. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think it's a disingenuous argument yeah. because they, they don't actually care about the cloud providers. They're just stopping, they're trying to stop them. They're just using it to drive adoption. They don't actually need any of the contributors. It's all, it's, it's, yeah. Right. So um, how does open source actually work? Um, so we're gonna talk about open source generically, so I'm gonna use the Linux kernel as an example because that's what you do in presentations. Um, and specifically around that, what I wanna pay attention to is the DCO. Um, personally, I'm not like a huge advocate for the DCO, it has its uses, but I do think it actually captures the ethos of free software development pretty well and it's why it's so popular with software developers. Um, but by, when you contribute to the Linux kernel or any project using the DCO, by making a contribution to this project, I certify that the contribution was created in whole or in part by me, which is fine, right? Like, you can do that. And I have the right to submit it underneath the open source -like license indicated in the file. 
right? So what's interesting about this, in contrast to the model that Redis and MongoDB has set up, is that the Linux Convertible Development Project is willing to take contributions underneath open source licenses, right? They're participating in the community at that point. They're willing to live by the same licenses that they're willing to distribute under, right? The Linux kernel is released underneath GPLv2 plus some stuff, right? They're willing to take to, there's the, um, uh, some, there's a few exceptions like um, termination of rights and having Red Hat has announced that they won't immediately terminate your rights as long as you come into compliance. There's a whole bunch of other companies that have done that as well. Um, so there's some exceptions from some of the copyright holders. Um, I think that's what the look on your face was. But basically it's GPLv2. Uh, they're willing to take contributions underneath GPLv2. If you show up to the Linux kernel project and say, I wrote some code, it's underneath GPLv2, and the Linux kernel contributors say, like, oh, yeah, we like it, that's good. And I'm like, and you ask them, like, do you have a problem taking it underneath the GPLv2 license? They're like, no. I'm like, why would we, right? It, the question doesn't make sense for them. If you go to MongoDB, and before they did their license switch, and you ask them, like, hey, I've got some great code, it would make your product a lot more valuable, to your customers, um, but it's underneath AGPL. Would MongoDB take that? They would probably come back and say, like, do you mind just changing that license on it? Just sign the CLE. We can't take it underneath the AGPL. Um, so how else does open source work? Well, no one actually sells the Linux kernel, right? Um, for a brief period of time, the Free Software Foundation actually did sell software. They sold copies of software, um, and then the internet um, became widely available, and GitHub became available. And I mean, maybe you can buy copies of free software from the Free Software Foundation or from Walnut Creek still. It, it might be possible. I wouldn't describe it on the webpage, but that's not really how people make money off of this, right? Um, companies do sell services, right? Red Hat makes a lot of money, a lot of money. Um, they don't actually sell software. They sell services. Um, and companies find values in their reputation and brand for providing these services, right? Um, there's a reason why I'm going to use Red Hat as an example, because we all know about their brand and reputation. It's high-quality software, right? Governments and large companies can trust the Red Hat brand. Canonical wishes they had the brand and reputation of Red Hat. They've got the, basically the same software, they just don't have the brand and reputation, right? That's why Red Hat's worth more. Um, so what does Red Hat sell? They sell support services, right? If you want to run that Linux kernel that's eight years old, how do you do that? You don't do it by tracking upstream. You actually don't do it by tracking canonical either because they don't do support cycles that long. Red Hat does it though. And if you're a conservative organization and you want to make sure you have those latest security patches and never upgrade your OS, you pay money to Red Hat to make sure that that's happening. And it's got to happen quickly too, right? There's value in them being available and having the expertise to patch the Linux kernel really quickly. The old Linux kernel, the eight-year-old Linux kernel, when a new patch comes out in upstream. Um, they sell engineering services if you want to customize your services. They sell certification and training, right? Um, so other open source companies. Um, I work for another open source company. I, don't, I feel weird talking about the company I work for. Um, I just like them to pay for trips. Um, and then I don't use their slide deck. Um, so, but here's another completely random company that I have no affiliation with, but I like their homepage because it kind of illustrates what I think are successful open source companies. If you go to Best Practicals homepage, anyone ever used RT? Um, they will advertise. Um, one of the things they sell is complete code freedom. You're not locked into your vendor. That's something that com uh, customers value. They don't like vendor lock-in. They like being able to have a choice. We actively advertise that to our customers. We tell government agencies, hire us, you can fire us if we stop doing a bad job. That's part of our sales pitch. If we stop doing a bad job, get rid of us. That gives us motivation to keep doing a good job. Stop doing a bad job. Oh, if we start doing a bad job, sorry, yes, yes. Product support, right? Um, you get the experts in the software, right? You hire best practical because they wrote RT, right? So they know the answers to it. How to deploy it, they can make that quicker, right? I paid them money when I worked in-house at a government agency because they could do it quicker than my staff would. It was just cheaper to pay them a lot of money than have my own staff learn how to do it. And manage hosting, right? Yeah, I'm gonna have to compete against AWS on that. Actually, they, they tell you, like in the previous one, like we'll deploy it to AWS for you or we'll host it for you. Um, and public training, right? They'll train your staff on how to use the software because they're still the experts. Um, so how does open source software actually work? You don't sell the software. 
Um, part of the value you give is giving your customers freedom, right? We're selling our customers freedom. Um, and you're competing on qualities of service. My company likes to say that we're monetizing presence. We don't charge you for what we did before, but we're going to charge you for being there today. Right? If you want my time, pay me to show up. Um, so what do you really need to do? Um, and I'll wrap up, I think, here. Um, but what you need to do is recognize the real value that you're providing if you're in an open source business. And the real value you're providing is not the software you're producing. There's no value in that. Anyone can give your customers a copy of the open source software. The real value you're providing is your presence. It's your expertise. It's the possibility for making changes in the future or for them asking for help. Um, so if you want to be successful in this business, and maybe you can make more money as a proprietary software company, and I'm not telling you that's not a business model you shouldn't pursue. But if you want to be an open source company, recognize the real value there. And it's not actually in the software. So, all right. Anyone have any questions? Sorry, just before we take questions, I wanted to, um, yeah, I wanted to give you this here. This is a, a gift for you for speaking for us. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we'll uh, take questions. Just raise your hand, and I'll pass the mic to you. Yes. Do you think that CLAs are more popular uh, now because the FSF still effectively has a CLA? Now, I understand it's not exactly the same, but it's still perhaps legitimizing yeah. CLAs. Yeah, the FSF is always... Uh, and it's from like... No, and this is for the people watching on yeah. So the Free Software Foundation traditionally has required um, assignment of copyright. I don't know how consistently they do that anymore. I'm not actually, I don't keep track of that. I will tell you that my company recently adopted the CLA, uh, which was pretty much entirely my decision. Um, and the reason why I did it was I thought long and hard. I'm like, how do I get other companies to contribute their contributions underneath a free software license without spending hours and hours on phone with their legal counsel? Man, I don't think that's possible. Uh, how could I do this? Oh, um, Google uses the Apache CLA with some slight modifications, um, which would be give good enough because they would give me the unlimited rights, which is more than I actually need. All I need is GPLv2 or later an iCode base. Um, but if I point to them and say it's the same CLA that Google uses, they'll just sign it. OK. That's why we use a CLA that provides unlimited rights, because I don't know how to minimize the transaction cost to just get GPLv2 or later. Uh, so if I get you right, do you require the CLA? Uh, take the mic. <laughs> so um, I do. Um, I wish my engineers did. <laughs> Um, it's relatively new uh, for the product I'm thinking of right now. We adopted it recently, and we're trying to improve our policies. Um, and I, I do, and the reason why that I require a CLA um, is because we have lots of other contracts with companies that contribute to our code base. And those other contracts define rights and conditions and terms, uh, many of which have to do with copyright ownership. Um, and I need a CLA, a written CLA, to make sure that it's clear that their contributions are underneath an open source license or in this case, unlimited rights. Um, because there's lots of paperwork floating around. So. Any other qu one more question? One more question. Right. If there are more questions, thank you.